was there any that you thought stood out to you um, from the crowd or from the rest of them that you think it's important to touch on in terms of clinical implications? So I think there were several um, that had really, really high impact on, right? Um, the one that, um, that people will talk about, um, you know, we have to sit at home because of the social distancing. So we do have a little bit of time. And I know that a lot of people tuned in for the virtual ACC meeting. But the one that um, I think had the most highest um, discussion on Twitter was the Partners 3 trial, uh, the low-risk trial with two years outcome. So the biggest question was that the delta of the difference between the primary outcomes between Taver and Saver, one year Taver was superior to Saver, but that delta has diminished over time. And you know, between one year and two year, um, they call it landmark analysis. When they did the landmark analysis, the, uh, the mortality was higher with Taver, um, and then the stroke rate was higher with Taver. Um, again, it's a subgroup analysis. You know, the numbers are very low, and it's hard to tease out whether this was really statistically significant. But I think with the glorious rosy victory of Taver, um, a lot of the Saber proponents are raising some questions about the superiority of Taver in these low risk patients in a long term. So, you know, these analysis. Yes, you can see the trend, and you know if that trend continues, it will cross over time. Just like you know people are predicting with the Partners Two A study, but um, we just don't know. You know, you you will often see these curves. You know, look like it's going to cross, but it diverges in a different direction again. So I think that's why it's going to be very important to know about five year outcome, and we probably would want to know what the three year outcomes is. And, you know, I think all these outcomes will make a significant difference. You have to remember that this Partners 3 trial will be followed for 10 years. So I think we will have a lot of plenty of data to assess in the future to know whether this trend was just temporary or it will continue. One of the ones I wanted to touch on um, from ACC20 was the results of the popular TAVI trial cohort B study um, and what it tells us about oral anticoagulation therapy. Um, let me just ask you, what do you think of the results and are they enough to change the way clinicians practice now or do we still need more data in regards to anticoagulation following TAVR? You know, I think the cohort B study was, uh, was something that we anticipated. So, you know, those of you know, those of who didn't really um, hear about this study was um, it is a, an, is a post-procedural, post-TAVR anticoagulation study. And this cohort B looked at patients who were already on anticoagulation before TAVR. And they looked at whether adding Plavix, clopidogrel, had more complication rate or not. And expectedly, the addition of Plavix did result in higher bleeding. Therefore, you know, the authors concluded that these groups will benefit with just putting them on anticoagulation, so vitamin K antagonists or NOACs. And I think a lot of people were putting these patients on um, triple therapy or double therapy, um, depending on where, the, where you are at, um, just because you know, a lot of these clinical trials did so. But, um, you know, I think we're getting more evidence showing that you don't really need to put these patients on multiple medication. So, and it's much easier for us too, if we don't really have to add other medications. So I think that this, this one's a pretty easy one to incorporate into our practice. So it may unify the, um, the variety of anticoagulation strategies that people were using into just using vitamin K antagonists versus NOAX if they were on it already. Um, about 75% of people were on vitamin K antagonists. So I think the answer, you know, with which one is superior does not really get answered with this trial, but um, the addition of antiplatelets really does not add benefit. It's actually harmful. So I think this is, you know, pretty useful data 
uh, to change our practice. We'll see what the, um, what the future trial, the cohort A is going to be. I think that's what a lot of people will be interested in too, so. All right, and now just lastly, before I let you go, um, staying on topic, sort of, uh, you mentioned low risk data on low risk patients. Um, the one late breaker, tavern patients with severe bicuspid aortic valve stenosis at low predicted risk of mortality. Can you take me through what that study told us? Yeah, um, that study was, you know, actually done at all these high volume institutions um, of self-expanding self valve users. So, you know, you have to add or you have to think that a lot of these implanters were very, 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 very well experienced. Um, their operative mortality and the stroke rate was excellent. So, you know, I think the, the message from the trial was that, you know, bicuspid auric valve, you can treat them with, with self-expanding valve. I think that message to a certain extent is definitely true. But I think we have to take the result with, um, with a little bit of grain of salt. Um, Number one is the fact that I mentioned a lot of these implanters were very well experienced, top notch implanters. So, can you reproduce that result in a real world setting? I don't know if that is possible. The second thing is that you know, the pacemaker rate was relatively high; it was about fifteen percent. So, you know, it's it constantly has been um, about fifteen percent, but um, the comparison direct competition in this group, low risk by cuspid patients, will be surgery. And the surgical pacemaker risk is about 5%. And would that have a long-term impact in these younger populations? Um, I'm pretty sure they will have an impact. And, you know, 15% pacemaker rate is a little high. A um, little bit in relation to that is the risk of uh, pervabular leaks. So PVL over moderate was not really significant. Um, I can't remember the exact percentage, but it was extremely low. But um, the mild pervabular lake rate was actually quite high. It was about 40%. And, um, you know, it's because of all these calcifications that, uh, that these bicuspid valves have. This one in particular mainly included the type 1s, uh, which is a fusion between the two leaflets. And they had some type zeros. But um, those fused type 1s tend to have a lot of bulk of calcium, and that likely is the cause for these paravabular leaks. And what would these 40% of mild PPL do in the future, these young patients? Um, I think we've seen with the Partners 2 um, that was presented last year, seeing that um, even the mild PPL had some trends towards worse outcomes um, at five years. So, you know, in these younger patients, would that have an impact in a long term? You know, similar to the pacemaker. In my opinion, I think they will. And I don't know if this result would strongly push me to self-expanding valves if they're truly low risk for surgical AVR. And this question really has not been answered uh, with this.